call this uh, board of ed, regular board of ed meeting to order. Please rise for the pledge. Yeah. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yes, to start at the back of the LGI. I need a motion to adjourn to executive session to review the employment history of particular individuals to discuss matters made exempt by federal and state law uh, with regard to student matters. The, uh, on the record, it says the motion to be changed. Be changed. There, yeah, I'll go over the revisions when we review the agenda. So moved. Need a second? Need a second. All in favor? Hi. Uh, Matt's going to begin with an administrative update, and Andrew's going to follow the information about the tax warrant. Okay, so um, we wanted to update the board and the community as a team about some things we're working on and very excited about for this school year. First, we had a request just to uh, just to go over uh, teaching positions that uh, were either budgeted for or grant funded that we are filling for this upcoming year or have filled for this upcoming year. So I'll start with three class size reduction positions, one at Glenham, one at South Avenue, and one at Sargent. We are, those are all in place. Those are, I think, were the first ones that we appointed back uh, in May or June. And, and so those are all ready to roll. We had one special education position that we have filled. Uh, <clears throat> we also hired two elementary PE positions. That was to move the elementary level to a four-day special schedule. Uh, every elementary student in every school, no matter what grade, will have two PE out of every four days, one art and one music library will still exist, it will still be full time at each building, and students will go to library outside of that rotation. And so they'll go to library sort of in a more traditional way uh, to focus on literacy skills and to check out reading material, but then they'll also visit the library uh, to experience makerspace projects and other, other innovative kind of programming that we've been working on uh, this summer and will continue to work on this year. So we're really excited about that. So in the uh, last year's budget, we also had, uh, I think the way we reframed it was a CODA or another special education teacher. CODA is a certified occupational therapist assistant. Uh, after reviewing uh, needs of the district this summer, we, uh, working with Don Candelo, our PPS director, we changed the, uh, to a .6 OT. Instead of a full-time CODA, we feel like, uh, and we have just posted for this, correct? And so uh, we feel like the .6 OT uh, will better kind of meet the needs. Uh, one of the reasons being an OT is obviously it kind of works independently. CODA needs supervision. And what we need right now to be the needs of students in the district is, is more OT. Uh, so that's what we're going to do with that. And in the super exciting news category, the grant that we won a few months ago from the state, Part of the grant was for fourth grade instrumental music to get started. And we are, it looks like we're gonna be able to start it. So we posted for this position, we had some good applicants. And our hope is at the September 11th meeting, we will be appointing the fourth grade instrumental music person. So they will not, fourth graders will not on September 12th, you know, come in and grab instruments and start playing. We're going to have this person work with the uh, current elementary instrumental music teacher uh, for a few weeks with the goal being to, uh, we need to figure out what instruments we need to purchase, which are also in the grant, that, that funding. And, and we also just kind of want this person to see how it works. 
in the elementary building. So our hope is that fourth grade instrument music is up and running uh, by the end of October. So we are really excited about that uh, to get that moving. So, uh, and we are just about all staffed, staffed up for the school year. Uh, unless we have like you know let late resignations or something like that, we're we're looking really good in terms of staffing for this school year. So it is really exciting to see the grant uh, really start coming to fruition with people applying and having committee interviews, et cetera, et cetera. We will uh, just note that the interviews for that particular position, uh, like we've been doing for most of our positions, had both the internal stakeholders and external stakeholders as part of the process, and Celia was the chair of that hiring committee. All right, so uh, our theme with our administrative team this year is that we're really focusing on the themes of excellence, equity, and communication, and that the underlying foundation of our work is that we're trying to get out of our comfort zone. And so uh, the comfort zone is a place that is very easy to retreat to, and sometimes we spend way too much time there, and so we're asking everybody on the administrative team to try to find ways this year to get out of their comfort zone, uh, especially in ways that focus on uh, developing a more equitable district, especially in ways that uh, increases strong communication with both uh, students, families, and, uh, and staff members and also ways uh, to build a more excellent school district. And by excellent, I mean uh, a, a district where students are not only uh, learning at high levels, but also uh, being supported in a social emotional way as well. And so uh, we're gonna try to model, practice what we preach or model. So, so although I, I try to be outside of my comfort zone, uh, a lot. Uh, it's always good to not sort of rest on last year's projects and so I'm going to start and then members of the team are going to come in with what they're going to focus on. This is a workshop so feel free to uh, chime in with comments or questions but these are just some things that uh, I personally will be heading up this year. One is to create a student advisory council uh, for the district. The student advisory council would meet with uh, me and other administrators. Uh, on a monthly basis, we will focus on uh, students from Rombout and Beacon High School to be members. Uh, we'll get the school year, we'll get going for a couple weeks, and I'll put out a call for students to apply uh, to be members of that. Uh, we kind of want, obviously, a really uh, diverse group of students for that, and so that, that's what we'll be looking for. I think the main thing we'll be looking for in the application is just students who are willing uh, to commit uh, to meeting and the meetings will be during the school day and so it won't be uh, a difficulty for students to be a part of it. Uh, a huge task is creating a strategic coherence plan for the district and uh, creating another committee, a strategic planning committee. I've spoken about that at previous board meetings. I won't get in depth with that right now because uh, I could probably go on forever about that but uh, that is work even though I've been a part of it in many other places, it's a work. It, it's some work that uh, definitely sort of puts us all on the leading edge. Uh, we're creating a new support structure for our principals and department heads. It seems kind of obvious, so I'm not going to spend a ton, ton of time on it. But we're going to continue having our big meeting structure where we all meet and discuss issues. Uh, but we will be meeting. The four of us will be meeting with individual principals and department heads on a either weekly or biweekly basis. Uh, to to deal with you know the small things that come up, but to do a weekly or biweekly reminder of uh, and sort of support the work of equity, excellence, and communication in the district. So we asked all of our administrators to come up with uh, what they want their work project goals to be for the year, and we want to spend all year supporting that work. So a, a chunk of our Mondays and Fridays we'll be meeting with uh, department heads or principals uh, to make sure they're supported in moving this work forward. Uh, another area where the whole district uh, will be moving towards this year is we're going to be creating uh, building leadership teams. A building leadership team is uh, teachers, principal or administrators, and uh, parents that are focused on kind of long-range goals for the school. South Avenue School had a BLT, as they like to call it, last year, and so uh, Laura 
Laura Cahill spoke about it with the administrative team, uh, and we're going to be rolling that out this fall and asking for both parent volunteers and also looking for teacher leaders uh, to join those teams, and teachers will receive a stipend to be a part of that work. It will feel a little bit different for folks, uh, and I, I worked under the structures of principal for 11 years. It could be the very same people that are involved with the PTO, uh, but it's, it's sort of looking to, uh, to create um, you know, a, a long-range plan, long-range goals for the, dis or excuse me, for the school, and to really try to sort of uh, develop consensus around it and try to move the work forward instead of it just coming from one or two people. Another area that I'll be uh, deeply focused with, uh, deeply focused with, excuse me, is uh, facilitating the equity work in the district. We started that work this summer. Our administrators uh, did a day retreat here in Beacon, and then uh, almost all of us attended a two-day conference in Ithaca focused on diversity and inclusivity. I'll be working with principals uh, to support their teams. They're going to have teacher leaders focus on this work. I want, uh, I want schools to have different areas they focus on, but I, I want uh, families to feel welcome, students to feel safe, and us as a district uh, to focus on uh, working against race, ethnicity, gender, disability as predictors of student success or really student participation and the things that we offer in the district. Uh, so I'm going to continue with the community engagement. I think a lot of superintendents do what I did during the first year. My goal is to continue it at that high level uh, for all the years that I'm here. Uh, so, so it may look a little bit different this year. I may be more targeted. It may it probably will be focused on developing the strategic plan, but I plan on having a similar number of community forums that I had last year and also looking at ways of developing a, a deeper online community engagement with folks as well. And then I think an area where I was lacking a little bit in last year was I spent a lot of time engaging with the community. Uh, I need to spend more time also engaging with staff. And so having open forums for uh, teachers and staff uh, to talk with me about a variety of issues and creating some more structured ways, like having, uh, we had an advisory group with the Beacon Teachers Association last year, uh, but me making sure that it happens on a monthly basis, things like that, I'm excited uh, to really move that work forward. So you see some themes here. A lot of it is still listening, but it's uh, moving the district forward to be more strategic, to focus on equity work. It's also a focus on beyond the listening part is really developing partners with people, whether it's our students, whether it's our families, uh, whether it's our employees that uh, we really start to engage at a high level with all of our stakeholders. So uh, these are areas that I'm going to be focused on this year. And then uh, members of my team are going to talk about areas that they're going to focus on as well. And so next up is Anne Marie. Are you taking questions during or? Yeah, sure. Okay. So just one question about the, um, the parents who would part be part of the advisory. Mm -hmm. um, I think that um, having been part of two different PTOs, the common thing is that there's the same people who sort of show up everywhere. They definitely yeah. develop a relationship um, with people in the building. So I think their voices are are heard. I would be really curious to see, you had talked about the students would be during school day, so there would be no barriers. I'd like to hear more um, or for you guys to go forward and think about working parents and parents who haven't typically been involved and how you would engage them. Yeah. We have some fleshing out with this to do. We spent time at our administrative retreat starting to talk about like how we want to roll this out. So that's why we've pushed it a little bit into the fall. Like I probably see us rolling this out in October just to give us a little time. Uh, so we're at least a little bit consistent. Um, I, I had a really great experience in my previous district. I created a special education advisory uh, group that had a, a large number of uh, parents or, or uh, caregivers on it and a, and a large number of staff. One of the things we did was we, we tried to have the meetings. I, I know there's you know the same strategies, and sometimes they work and sometimes they don't, but uh, we tried to move the meetings around a little bit, and we also tried to sort of change the time a little bit too. And I think more than anything, people appreciated the effort and tried to come to the <laughs> meetings more. And the other thing I think that made people really come to those meetings at a, and participate at a high level is they felt like their voice was making a difference. 
and so and so we want you know we want the same thing with this work um, so you know it's it's an experiment it's something that uh, we haven't done a lot of here in Beacon but I think it's uh, it's definitely the next step that we need to take uh, we you know we need to be more involved than just that sort of this district level like every every school or department needs to have almost like a, an advisory group of their own and so uh, so you know we're excited to get it started at the end if you have questions of any of us I mean anytime during it ask a question but at the end if you're like oh yeah I want to ask Matt just you know it's informal so just holler all right Anne Marie okay so um, our mission on the support services side um, is to support the people doing the work in the buildings and the work at district level. So um, I start with food service department. Um, Karen and I have had major conversations on uh, sustainability, um, on being more green, um, and trying to uh, eventually eliminate all the non-recyclable items. Um, so that's a goal of uh, both of ours to do. Our facilities department um, will start planning the next capital project. I know that sounds, that would make Mike happy, although he's not here. Um, but it will um, it'll be here before we know it. Um, and so we wanted to see what um, the building level needs are um, and what people are thinking about. We're also going to uh, facilitate a recycling program in all the schools, and we've talked about that. And uh, we've had a uh, a survey. We've had we, we applied for a grant, so that's kind of installing it a little bit. Um, but we are going to roll that out. Um, Anthony is on board with that as well. So that's we've we've heard that from a lot of stakeholders in the district. Our transportation department, um, which are always very reactive, so I you know. Um, we all field a lot of phone calls at the beginning of the year about transportation. So Ron and I will talk about being a little bit more proactive and thinking outside the box and not breaking rules and not doing things that we're not allowed to do, but, but kind of stretching the rules a little bit and trying to be a little bit more open-minded about things. Um, he and I have started these conversations um, this year um, just about, you know, um, letting kids ride on a bus again not breaking the rules but being a little bit more um, open-minded so we're going to work hard on that for this year um, also increased field trips and other educational experiences so I you know I heard that loud and clear when we were having meetings with the principals um, it's an important thing for children to get out of the classroom and learn in other ways so um, we're going to think outside the box um, on that as well and assist uh, the building level principals in getting that done In its totality, it would be a big change. We're going to gradually work towards that. I'm hoping by the end of the year we can totally eliminate that. Karen and I have to kind of work um, on it. Um, she has a couple of different proposals. Um, some of them, some of them were um, we have dishwashers in some of the buildings, so we may start there. And then the the buildings that don't have the major equipment, instead of buying something like that, we will go to a more green concept. Um, so, in fact, I have a meeting with her this week. We're going to start the process and talking about it because it is an it is an issue. Um, Dutchess County will eventually have us recycle everything, and, and it'll get to the point. So, again, we're trying to be proactive. So, we want to try to do it before we're mandated and, you not know, to. This one also uh, during the next budget cycle may be just something that we need to just straight up support in the budget. I think this one, I think for a lot of people, is just reaching this thing that we just we just need to you know, make happen, so. Um. Maybe in conversation with the county, maybe they'll, uh, maybe you can pitch it to them if they've got some funds that they should as a pilot, fund it as a pilot. Well, we are hoping that this um, grant, because it's, it's facilities and it's also food service, so um, it got a little bit delayed. We're hoping because that would give us a little bit of funding to kind of jumpstart the program, and then we can sustain it through the budget um, later, so. Um, if not, we're going to start the program without it. We're not going to not do it if we don't get the grant funding. Uh, a point on the uh, dishwasher issue. Some of our schools have and some don't. Okay. That may be something that we can remediate in the next capital program. But at least we should be taking a look at it. I think. That may not be the preferred way. Um, 
people would rather have recyclable trays than, than because that um, having the dishwasher requires trays and things that you can wash and staff and you know so it might be a better option just to go the recycling way so we're not sure yet for the short term we can use what we have but there's always you know costs related to that too so I'm also not sure the recycling is immune from some problems in that industry China has rejected a lot of our garbage that we like to call recyclables and that's where most of it goes and they put the hammer down things might change see so none of the uh, none of the options are a hundred percent without right. um, some awesome. some planning so, okay, Celia. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so for uh, leadership out of my newly minted office of human resources and accountability systems, um, things uh, that we'll focus on this year. One is uh, important as, aspect as it relates to human resources, the creation of feedback loops uh, for the purpose of supporting our school uh, level administrators and department heads. Uh, for, with APPR and professional learning needs. So specifically, this is about uh, creating uh, ways that we systematically look at uh, through quarter, quarterly uh, feedback and review cycles of what the growth and development looks like for our probationary uh, teaching staff across the district and within the schools, as well as what we're learning about where the uh, strengths and the assets of all of our staff at the school lie as it relates to professional practice uh, and what the new and emerging needs may be within schools and then across across schools. And when we do that in a systematic way with support from all of us here as part of the executive team, what we'll get is a really robust uh, system of supervision and professional growth support. Uh, so that's the next step of this process for us this coming year. In addition to that, um, as a part of accountability uh, systems, this is about how we align and build integrity in across all of our data systems. And so continuing to work this year in a purposeful and intentional way to break down some of the silos of all the various uh, reporting uh, mechanisms we have and the various uh, data systems that we're using to work in collaboration with bringing together our director of technology, with our director of pupil personnel, with myself, with Mr. Wright, uh, with our related staff that support that so that we can make uh, usable data systems that uh, at, will support our school level leaders. A huge component of this is uh, bu the building out of the equity report cards that we've talked a lot about. Um, and again, this is to make one for us to have it as a district-wide tool and one that we'll continue to use as part of the work that we're doing in the diversity committee of the district, but also so that each of our schools and their school level equity teams as well as their building leadership teams have uh, the resources at hand so that it helps to inform um, the, the decisions and the thinking that they're doing at a school level as it relates to uh, put, moving forward their uh, school level goals. And so that will be part of the leadership of my work of how uh, we make those, make those uh, elements uh, accessible and meaningful and visibly useful for, for many stakeholders. Another aspect of the work is really to build on and initiate uh, celebration and recognition rituals for, to celebrate our staff milestones of, uh, you know, uh, milestones in terms of uh, successful uh, service to the district, um, the attainment of longevity milestones, uh, the, but really, another, so that's one piece of it and we do do that to some extent with some of our end of, end of year uh, district celebrations. But another aspect that's really important that's part of the development of all of our, uh, our human capital and our staff, uh, our staff systems is how we begin to celebrate and recognize innovative and promising practices. So if that's work uh, that we have that we value at all levels, that we want our district to continue to move forward in, in, in an innovative approach to really redesign what 21st century learning environments look like for us here in the district, we also want to be able to celebrate our teachers uh, and our administrators and staff at, at all levels for being risk takers, 
for uh, going out and uh, you know being part of some out of the box work that we're doing and to be able to continue to empower those across the district and that's really it's really important that we celebrate what those achievements are um, and what the pathways to you know kind of forging and new directions uh, that benefit our students and families are and so that's part of the work that uh, will be will be happening from my office and to, in support across the district a huge aspect of our work this year is going to be to help support the transition uh, for us as a district into uh, what's affectionately known as ESSA, but it's the Every Student Succeeds Act, uh, the accountability requirements and systems. It is the uh, next iteration uh, from the, fe from the uh, federal uh, No Child Left Behind that was, uh, that was enacted into, into law uh, uh, two years ago. And so at a, we have a state level plan um, that is, and there will be more information I'd love to share with all of you to come uh, at an upcoming uh, board, board workshop uh, because there will be information coming out from the states with regard to districts uh, and the new system uh, at, at in, in early October. And so part of this work is to be mindful of what those accountability systems look like to not get hyper focused on compliance as a task in and of itself but for us to be able to know those requirements to be able to use the information as a guiding point and a litmus of where we are in relation to where we desire to go but also to be able to ensure that we're keeping focus on what we've prioritized as the critical work of the district and that those two things don't, are not necessarily counterintuitive to each other but the system um, of the overhaul of the new accountability system has changes in it uh, and so more information to come but part of my work will be helping our schools and our school leaders navigate through what that means for for each of the schools as well as for us as a district last in in uh, in, in, uh, in the vein of how we're increasing uh, all of our engagement and uh, communication and feedback uh, will be that uh, Ms. Quarteroni and I will co-facilitate an HR advisory council of our internal stakeholders and so aspects of personnel management of human resources uh, on the on the personnel staffing certification and employment uh, end of it as well as payroll uh, really are uh, are interdependent of each other and this is about being able to create ways for us to hear uh, what what are new or, or emerging needs or things that we can inform how we make all of the work more efficient and effective and more streamlined and so that's work that will be starting up this year as well I'll pass then on to then Mr. Wright. So for my office, it's, this year is about bringing the curriculum to life. I think that um, over the past few years, we've worked to try to um, get our curriculum aligned to standards and to also ensure that um, that um, that each each class on on a grade was doing you know similar activities within within the curriculum so now you know it's about bringing it to life what's been great over the past over this past summer is that we really begin to look at science at our science curriculum um, you know it's with the new standards the, the new New York State um, science learning standards it's not about just doing you know a learning science anymore it's about doing science you know we want to create uh, uh, learners who are really engaged in the process of science, you know, and, and understanding concepts, and um, including technology into the <clears throat> into the work as well. So, this summer, you know, we had the opportunity to um, really begin honing in on our elementary curriculum. Um, we bought, we 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 put curriculum teams together, and we tapped into the um, the expertise and knowledge of one of our administrators. Um, Cassandra Orsa at Glenham, who's um, certified a certified science teacher, and um, she's helped with the science curriculum for uh, K to five schools, pre K to five school. What we did this summer, actually two weeks ago, is we um, we developed a unit for each for each class for each grade, and the purpose of it is to have teachers begin to uh, facilitate the lessons within the unit. 
and to uh, come back together to, to talk about um, what we've seen, what we've noticed. So therefore, we'll know we're on the right track um, in terms of aligning our curriculum to the new standards. We've, we've also worked with um, TEQ Tech, which is a company that, um, that, um, that we purchased a lot of our smart boards from in the past. We work with them, and they're in the process of uh, creating, creating STEM and STEAM curriculum for, um, for schools throughout. Uh, throughout the country. We are, we're trying to get in on the ground end of that so that we're able to um, be the first to work with this, with this company. And in, and in doing so, what we are doing, um, what, we are able, uh, what we hope to be successful in doing is to create, um, have our library media specialists take part in curriculum planning for STEM and STEAM. Um, so right now, uh, we're in the process of creating a framework for grades three to five um, STEM and STEAM curriculum for our library media specialists. And then next year, we want to um, phase it down to grades pre-K through two. Um, and our, at our middle school, we are collaborating much more with Beacon Institute this year. Um, and with that being said, um, Clarkson University will also be part of the process. You know, as you know, uh, two summers ago, well, last summer, we started with the science camp for our middle school students. We did that again this summer, but now we're bringing them into the school day. Um, there are a couple of proposals that they have brought forth to us that we will be taking part of uh, this, this school year. In addition to that, we've had our, our middle school science teachers work with Clarkson University to create curriculum aligned to the New York State Science Learning Standards. We went back and forth over uh, during, the, um, during the spring months trying to determine if it was best to purchase curriculum or create curriculum. And the teachers, to their credit, decided that it would be best you know, to create curriculum. So like I said, we collaborated with, um, with Beacon Institute and Clarkson University. Karen, I have a yes. question about that. So mm -hmm. when we've done the summer camp in the past, that was so great, but it did reach a limited number of students. Yes. Is this something that's going to touch on every student, every class, regardless of? Yes, yes, because it's going to be um, um, it's going to be included in our curriculum grade six to eight. Yes. Do you feel you have enough partners in the state project? Are you talking about at the elementary, the, the elementary the, level, whatever level, and all the levels? I would say. You, sorry, maybe the mic. Do you feel like you have enough partners? I know you partnered with Clarkson, which is which Beacon is to uh, is is uh, is um, run under. Um, you need more partners, I guess. Um, potentially yes, but one of the things that we want to make sure that we do first and foremost is to make sure that we um, that there's a scaffold um, curriculum pre-K all the way to eight. You know, and if we bring in too many partners in this work without really having a plan, what will happen is that, you know, um, it won't be consistent. Okay. I mean, I, I, I mean, I think we do have, we already have uh, with the um, Hudson Valley seat with the, the farm to table. Absolutely. I mean, that's also science. Yes. This plans go into that. Yes. So mm -hmm. I, I definitely feel you should uh, add that also as another feather to the cap here. And, I was going to say something else in the general for all three things, but you know, I, I, I'm going to channel Mike. Um, you know, in that when we have uh, successes that we should celebrate them, we should advertise them. Absolutely, so. yes. That's you'll see that later on. Okay. Um, in terms of social studies, um, as you know, a couple of years ago, we actually purchased the Putnam Northern Westchester BOCES uh, Integrated Social um, Social Studies Curriculum. And there was a, comp a component that was missing. Um, fortunately, we have Mike Keeley with us this year. We're working to bring in the Discovery Streaming Plus uh, video service, which will then um, allow our teachers to access the part of the curriculum that was missing. What that'll do is it'll, it'll make it more interactive for our students and thus much more engaging. Um, we're, we're hoping to have that um, video streaming service within the next few weeks. And that's actually K through eight. 
And so, something that we were paying for and we couldn't access? Yes. Okay. Um, because you needed a subscription. And so what we did is we looked at one of the um, video uh, streaming programs that we had that wasn't being utilized, and um, we just phased it out. In terms of ELA, one of the, the good things that I'm super excited about this year is that we we will be putting in um, assessments and get grade six through seven this year. We started with grade six last year, but grade seven this year that are aligned to what's being done in grades three to five. Um, they were not using, in the past, they were not using the Fontes and Pinnell assessment, so there wasn't, um, um, they didn't have an alternate way to assess whether or not students were reading at grade level. This will be uh, the support that they need to make sure that that happens. Um, one of our assistant principals, uh, Lori Edelman, will be training on um, grade seven this year. She trained grade, grade six last year. So it'll be, what makes it so, so good is the fact that now um, students, students who already have been assessed in grades three through five would now continue that work in grades six through seven, six and seven this year. That's important because now we will have ways to ensure that when students go to RTI or even when they're in, um, receiving academic intervention services that we all speak in the same language. So field trips, as Anne-Marie uh, spoke about earlier, um, we want to ensure that all students have means to attend trips, you know, and that's our role at the district office as principals um, inform us of, you know, field trips that um, they are wanting to, you know, have students attend. That's, of course, um, aligned to the curriculum. You know, we want to do our part to ensure that um, it takes place, you know, within reason. Um, we want to make sure that it has a connection. Um, it connects the curriculum to the real world. You know, when students are, are, are having those opportunities, that makes it that much more engaging. So that's what we want to make sure happens this year. So on the student services side, um, the code of conduct, you know, as uh, Dr. Landau mentioned earlier, um, there are some revisions that are needed to the code of conduct. And um, that's one thing that I'm super excited about uh, taking, you know, taking the lead on this year. Uh, we want to ensure that restorative practices are, 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 are really a part of the, the new code of conduct. Uh, we want to make sure that our students are um, having opportunities to be brought back in, you know, uh, without, or before, I should say, not even just brought back in, but that they have opportunities to, um, alter alternative measures as opposed to just being um, disciplined from a punitive lens. Um, you know, in addition to that, we want to assure that our curriculum is um, that it's not disproportionate in terms of the manner in which students are being suspended. Um, that's that's really important, um, and the way that you do that is just looking at um, you categorize infractions, you know, from 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 having a range from minor to major. And therefore, when you have that, you're able to then um, determine um, where, where, do, where do the infractions fall, and then you're able to uh, support kids the way that they're needed to be supported. But in terms of the restorative piece, you know, it's about educating students, and I think that um, if we do a more effective job in doing that, we will then have less, uh, less infractions taking place throughout the course of the year. So, um, Mr. Zhang, you, you, you asked, you talked about um, just, you know, um, informing people of the good that's being done. One of the things that I want to focus on this year is I want to make sure that as we bring the curriculum to life that um, I'm using a platform to really uh, celebrate, you know, what our teachers are doing, but more important, what our students are doing. You know, we're a community of learners, and I think that um, – we really need to make sure that that's happening because there's some great work that's been taking place over the course of the years. And, um, you know, uh, we need to acknowledge our students and our staff for the work that they're doing. Do you have a timeline for the Code of Conduct and um, revision? Like, is that 
Did it be presented to the board at any specific date? Um, I didn't put a date to it yet because it's something that I don't want to rush. Mm -hmm. It's a sensitive, it's a sensitive topic, but more importantly, it's something that if done correctly, it is going to take some time mm -hmm. um, because we really have to look at. Um, I think we need to look at some models that are out there, and we have to really educate, um, you know, all of our community about you know different ways that could be um, more effective to supporting our students. You know, in addition to that. I, um, I want to make sure that you know every voice is heard you know in this process so it's, it's going to take some time. Is there a way to update us on the work that's done? I think Absolutely. It's important what we're learning because I, I think that obviously we want students to feel like this is moving in the right direction for them but I think we need to communicate the direction that's moving in, in an ongoing way. Absolutely yes and um, I, I want to make sure in that process that I am talking with students you know, I'm talking with staff, I'm talking with the community, you know, just so that I can get a real feel, okay. you know, for what's out there. One thing that uh, I forgot to mention I'll be working on with Eric and Celia is the, the other part of the grant, uh, the exploration into uh, starting the second world language. Um, currently, we, we just do Spanish. And so that will be a big project for us this year too, because the the goal, the way the grant was written, the uh, what what our desire in the grant was is, was to uh, to to have Mandarin added, but that it would be for the next school year. So that's something that we'll be working on all year this year too. Any other questions for us? I think um, it would, in general, it'd be great to have some sort of mid-year update as to how the goals are progressing and where we are. So it's right. hard work. Definitely. All right. Just my No, I think I have it. Okay, um, I have a few slides. Um, on the board agenda, we are asking the board to vote on the tax warrant. So I just wanted to give a little update at this meeting. Um, when we do the budget, we give you an estimate of where the taxes will be. Um, but now I have all the information to do the warrant, so I just want to go through a couple things with the board um, and with the public. So as you remember, um, we had asked you on, in May to vote for the budget and the bus proposition. And our levy um, increase for just the budget was 3.67%. And we, we added an additional 0.2% because, as you remember, with the buses, we finance it over five years to match the state aid. Um, so it's a 0.20%. Um, so the total is 3.87% levy. Um, there has been some conversations. I know some of the board members have been getting an email um, about the levy. So I thought I would do just a little bit of impact. Um, when tax cap calculation, when the legislation came out, everyone called it the 2% tax cap. Um, and it's not as simple as that. And I just want to maybe talk about some things that actually made why um, Beacon was allowed to go up to 3.87%. Um, there's there's uh, several calculations. Um, the one most important for Beacon this year was the tax base growth factor. Um, and the definition of that is a measure of the change in real property, and it's due to physical and quantity changes, so construction and capital improvements, which would definitely affect Beacon this year. In fact, Beacon's tax-based growth factor was the highest in Dutchess County this year. So what that does is it allows the levy to increase based upon um, these facts. The other, uh, the allowable growth factor is the 2% confusion. So you do the lesser of 2% or the change in inflation. Uh, the change of inflation was a little bit above 2, so they make it 2. So you're allowed to grow the levy um, from the prior year by both the tax base growth factor and the allowable growth factor. So for Beacon, that was a very positive increase, and that's why um, we were able to increase the levy um, more than we had done in the previous years. Yes. So are you saying that um, if somebody develops a piece of property or, I mean, what, what 5, 537,000 pieces of uh, dollars worth of property, um, that that property itself is not the one that's paying the extra levy, it's, it's distributed among everyone? 
I'll get I'll get to that. Okay. I'll get to that because I'm going to show you where we are as far as the tax rate and where we are as, as an average homeowner. So you'll see how it impacts. Okay. Um, the, uh, just a reminder that we allocate two and a half million of excess fund balance when we're doing uh, and reserves when we're doing the budget calculation. And um, in 1819, we're using 200,000, a little above that, of the tax reduction reserve. That's the last bit of the tax reduction reserve. We have used all of it. Um, and, but we've systematically used it. We need to use it within 10 years. We're about eight. So we're, we're pretty close uh, to being done, but that's the last piece of it. Tax reduction reserve, as you remember, was the proceeds of Old Beacon High School when you sell property. Um, you need to put it in a reserve and you need to systematically use it to reduce the tax levy, which we have done um, over the last eight years. So these are the changes in assessments, just to give you some kind of perspective from uh, last year to this year. So Beacon, Fishkill, and Wappingers also are an increase in assessed values. So assessed values are not only the change in your personal home that got reassessed and you're paying more, it's for more properties that are on the tax roll and I'll show you how that impacted um, the taxes. So these are the tax rates for homestead, which would be the homeowners, um, 1819 versus 1718. And as you will see, 1819, the tax rate per thousand is less than 1718. So this is the second year where the tax rate has been less than the previous year. Uh, star exemptions. I just showed this slide to kind of show you that the star exemption just systematically decreases um, every year. So that also has an impact on what your taxes will be. So for the city of Beacon, again, we always use the same median assessed value. I think next year in the budget I'll look at that again, but to try to give you an impact of um, what I pre we presented in budget and what we're presenting here. If you have that um, median home value house with the current star, you have a tax reduction of $69 from last year. In the town of Fishgill, with their median assessed value home and current year star, it would be a reduction of $91. And in Wappingers, same with the uh, median assessed of $350,500 with star, it's a reduction of $83. So again, this is the second year um, where we've had a reduction in, in uh, tax rate, and then a re which resulted in a reduction in taxes. Okay, now go ahead. But the median that you're presenting, like for example, Wappingers, you don't have a piece of Wappingers. Are you saying that that median represents all Wappingers or just the percentage? That is the median in Wappingers in um, in our in our district. Okay, in so our that's district. very specific. Because we run we run the tax reports just. Um, we just have the tax information from our district okay. on the tax program. And then, um, oh, go ahead. so my question about, so let's say, for example, property X, Y, and Z was developed, and their property increases 200%. Uh, um, <coughs> that allows for the growth factor to go up, but that growth factor gets distributed among all property owners? So the growth factor is something that's put out by New York State Taxation and Finance. So it's based upon real property tax information, and it's just, it's a rate, it's a percentage. Um, when you bring in more properties um, onto the tax rolls, you're basically taking the same amount of levy, because the levy stays the same, it's what we talk about at the budget, and you're spreading it out over <coughs> more properties. So that was, that's causing some of this to go down, some of your, the tax rate to go down. Um, so it's, it's kind of two different things. I think you're trying to put them together. Um, the, the tax base growth factor allows us to increase our levy because we are having more properties um, coming into our school district. It just allows us to be higher. For example, last year our levy increase was about one and a half. So we went from one and a half to three point. Eight, seven. That was part of it. It allowed the levy to grow by 500000 But when you do the levy, you, you take all of the assessed values across. So you saw all those three municipalities had increases. You take the levy and you spread it out over all the taxpayers in the city of uh, Beacon School District. So I, I know I'm oversimplifying, but it sounds like it's a yes. It sounds like... You and I think differently, so that's why I'm having a hard time. Go ahead, ask okay. me again. I mean, <laughs> the, you know, let's say the levy was one hundred. I mean, just hypothetically, one hundred thousand, and it goes up to one hundred and twenty thousand because um, property X, Y, and Z increase was able to bring in more property, which means that we can um, their 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 tax value is twenty thousand. Let's say so now we're up to one hundred and twenty. 
but so there's a growth factor of whatever that 20, extra twenty thousand creates, but that doesn't get charged to the twenty; that gets charged to the whole hundred and twenty. So what I think you're thinking of the tax base growth factor has to do just with the levy calculation. So all of that, all that does is allow the levy to be increased, right? So that's the levy side of it. Properties coming on is how we distribute the levy. So I think I, I know what you're you're saying, but the gro the um, the growth factor is is only in, is only used in the tax cap calculation. So it just allows it to grow. If we didn't have that, our levy increase would have been a lot smaller. But it allows Beacon City School District to increase the levy, to raise more taxes, to allow us to do a lot of the things that we did in the budget, because we were able to do that. So if I own property C. I am not one of that. I am not one of those new properties that came online. Do, am I affected by the growth factor? You Is are positively or negatively. You are. You're affected by the growth factor because the levy is is more than what you would normally have been paying, but you're also positively influenced because we're basically keeping your taxes, your taxes are actually going down a little bit because there's more properties, there's more people to pay in the same amount of the levy. So you're saying I would pay less than 2%? Well, you would pay less, period. So you're, you're trying to combine two different calculations? No, I, I am. So, so with, if those properties never came online, I would only pay 2%. So, but if those properties now that came <laughs> online, am I paying more than 2%? You would pay it. You would get some kind of tax-based growth factor, but it wouldn't be as much as what it is. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> so um, it's possible, despite those numbers, for an individual taxpayer to find that their taxes went up versus last year. If, for example, there was some change in that particular assessment that you put on a deck that would throw those numbers off, you could probably wind up paying more if they raised your personal assessment for that property. If the class that you're in changed relative to the other classes, for example, single family home versus duplexes and three family or beyond. And there's of course the factor of um, the homestead and the non-homestead, which is in effect in our district these municipalities, wouldn't that make a difference if they change the ratio between the homestead and the non-homestead? The non-home, the, the um, ratio between homestead and non-homestead is, is a three-part calculation and you have to use the average of the two. I did see the non-homestead rates decrease as well, maybe not to the proportion of homestead, um, but there, there is a, a way of, le you have to do it the exact same way all the time. Um, your comment about an a personal assessment is correct. If you have an older home and you've lived in it a very long time and you're reassessed, you, you may, may see a tax increase. Um, for people who are just recently bought their home and their assessments kind of stayed the same, you, you may actually see a, um, a reduction or a break even kind of thing. So it is, it is kind of individual. It's hard to show all that on the screen, so that's why we use a median. Um, but you, you will have certain, actually, some people's taxes will go down much more than what I showed, and some will go up. So it's kind of an, that's kind of the average is what I'm trying to show. Is there, thank you for putting all this together. This is complex. And, but I'm hoping it's helpful, because I, I know that it's it a is, difficult it, situation. It is, it is helpful, I imagine. Um, I may repeat some of the questions that Anthony and Greg are saying. Um, I think from my perspective, I've heard from people in the community who felt like they saw, they understood a 2% cap, and then these numbers came mm -hmm. around and it's larger. Mm -hmm. um, is there any public app information where people can access and look up to see whether or not their property was affected to go larger over 2% or under 2%? There a way that they can find out where they fit exactly in that. So they'll there. It's really going to be for an individual person. It would be a, basically affected by their assessment. So when they receive in a change in assessment, they will see they um, their taxes will be impacted. Usually, if you're getting a change in assessment, um, if you want to hear more, people want to do research on the tax cap calculation. There is a lot if they Google it. Um, and they go to New York State Taxation and Finance and the Controller's Office. There's information there. Um, during the budget process, 
I give the big long calculation of it, um, which is very confusing, and I try to sim make it simple, but it's not simple. Um, so it's it, it's it, we've just I know the board has gotten some emails from some taxpayers. That's why I wanted to try to address it here. Um, I answered some of the taxpayers by referring them back to prior meetings where we really kind of delved in a little bit more um, about it. But um, you know, people who have gotten reassessed who don't agree with their reassessment and they challenge it to the municipality where they live. There's also um, claims, so tax OCRs, when we talk about the audit and the financials, you'll talk, we have reserves for tax OCRs where people actually go and, and argue their assessments. Mm -hmm. So I know that there's some people out there that are not happy with some of their reassessments that Is are going all on. Is this information available online? I will put this PowerPoint on, and there's also all of the PowerPoints during the budget presentation are online mm -hmm. um, so that you can see that and you can kind of follow it through if they don't want to watch you know, um, the meetings. That PowerPoints are on, but I'll put this up tomorrow. Great, okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I, I like to refer to it not as the two percent tax cap, but as the nominal two percent tax cap to clue you in that there are all those wrinkles as you described. Okay. Okay. So I um, just want to review the agenda. There are a few things that were changed. First, um, our reasons for going into an executive session earlier changed. We uh, removed a real estate discussion and added a student matter. Um, the tax warrant document was revised. That's 11.1. 12.10 resolution language was added. 13.01. Uh, Non-instructional addendum added, 13.02. Instructional addendum added, and I think that's it. Um, are there any other questions about the agenda? Okay, so moving on. Um, are there any student or school presentations? Any parent groups? Um, open to the public. There's no one signed up, but does anyone have public comment? Uh, superintendent's report. I'll be really brief since we gave kind of a long presentation tonight. We, uh, we're just really excited, excited to get started. We have all of our staff coming together Thursday morning uh, in, the, uh, in the theater here in Beacon High School. I'll be talking about some of our focus areas and, and themes uh, of the year. And, uh, and then Tuesday, and then, so, excuse me, the rest of the day, teachers will be meeting in grade level teams and in the departments on some of the work that Eric was discussing, uh, moving that curriculum work forward. The teachers who worked on curriculum over the summer have a chance to share. Tuesday is a really valuable day for us because that's the day the teachers are all, mostly all, in their school buildings, um, having their first faculty meeting of the year, going over, um, you know, school focus areas and, and goals and whatnot, and also just the business stuff that you have to cover before the most important day, our students are coming back uh, on next Wednesday, and we are very, very excited to get going. So uh, I think the team here knows that I pretty much just want all the stuff to happen, you know, tomorrow, and uh, I'm really excited to get the year started. But uh, and and Thursday we're ending with we're ending the day with a little ice cream party in front of the Beacon High School for our staff and. I think a lot of the board's able to come over, so thank you for helping us out with that. And if you have a scoop, oh, BYU scoop. <laughs> <laughs> they have. <laughs> we were starting to do the math, and we may need some. So, uh, but thank you, and we're just excited to get started. Thanks. Um, so, committee reports, board comments, James. Uh, policy committee. We met on Wednesday. Um, I was nominated, elected to be the chair of that committee. Um, we, the highlights, we looked at the charging school meals policy, which we will be voting on tonight. We moved to pass uh, first, take it to a second, read to a vote. Um, but we decided to look at two future provisions, one of which is to, this is something that was going to look at the legal language of being able to forgive students past debt who have, uh, who qualify for free or reduced meal programs. And the second is to see if it's technically feasible to add the ability for any parent who's enrolled in an auto pay 
to be able to donate their year-end balance to needy families. Um, we're going to investigate that and revisit. Um, another thing which I wanted to just bring to the board is we discussed uh, a policy about uh, the notice of meetings. Um, one of the things that came up is in the language we talked about uh, electronically um, distributed to the public. We brought up the idea of using the school, the district's uh, email system to be able to distribute information about board meetings. Um, Matt said that you would look and see if that's feasibly, technically feasible and what's, what's involved with that. And I also wanted to temper check, temper check with the board to see if that's something we are interested in. Would that be like an opt-in thing? Yeah, I was going to say, if it's an opt-in, I think that would be really great. Yeah. I think the, the downside if we blanket everybody is just that right. they stop noticing important things. Right. But I think it's if somebody has a particular interest like policy or wellness or something that they, if there's a way without it being too much of a drag for them to opt-in, I think that would um, be... Yeah, we will check. Uh, um, our next meeting, I put forward, I just suggested a date of Wednesday, September 26th. We're waiting to hear back from the rest of the committee to see if that works. Um, and we have, the only thing I know of that's certainly on the agenda is we're going to be reviewing policies concerning homeschool students' access to uh, Beacon School District facilities and extracurricular. At that September At that September. Oh, at the, the date is to be determined. But to at, be the confirmed, next but at the next meeting. Okay. Okay. Well, we're past, almost past the month of August, which is your primary vacation month, and hopefully a couple of committees, and three of them that I serve on, will be able to set some kind of date soon so we can get back in stride. Uh, Mike's not here tonight uh, for facilities and operations. Uh, I think we had some difficulties with some trying to schedule over the month of August, but uh, as far as I know, things are moving along with the staff level and the uh, consultants. Um, public relations advocacy legislative, we need to set our first meeting on this newly updated and revised committee. So we're looking to two other members of that to see if we can nail something down before the week is up for sometime in September. And um, other than that, um, be happy to see school start again and uh, the rhythm of education resuming. Um, I think we've set some tentative dates for the Wellness Committee uh, starting September the 26th, so it'll be monthly on Wednesdays at 4. Um, we'll also work on getting child care, which will be helpful for anybody who wants to join. Um, that's all I know in terms of the Wellness Committee. I think, Anthony, you're going to speak to the Wellness Committee. I attended the policy committee meeting on Wednesday. Um, looking forward to working with that group to um, make some decisions and especially the reviewing of the homeschool policies. I'm interested in our discussion on that at our next meeting. And I am committed for September 26th. You can put me down. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. Good evening. Um, so, um, the uh, what I'm also working on for the policy committee is some sort of a crosswalk between the uh, old um, policies and the new policies, and, and then also trying to cross off the ones that have been replaced already, so that we can see what's left. Um, it also makes it easier for for parents to, if they want to look at the policies, to figure out which ones are 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 active and which ones are not. So um, that's all in the policy committee uh, work. Um, the, uh, also for diversity, uh, um, at the last meeting I mentioned about, maybe I didn't, the um, potentially having the first meeting is, is um, having uh, meetings at the second month of the, uh, second Tuesday, second Thursday of the month, um, but that uh, the one for September may be too soon, um, so it's looking at October, but I'm, I'm open to suggestions from the rest of the committee if they want to be sooner than that. In the meantime, um, you know, I would like to circulate the draft from um, Lucy, I'm sorry, uh, Miss Lucky, um, Lisa Lucky, I think. Liza. Liza Lucky, thank you. Um, and, um, 
uh, potentially maybe ask her to give a presentation if she's amenable to the diversity committee on that. Uh, also, uh, at, the la at the last university, before we broke for, the, for um, the summer, we talked about um, doing some uh, um, uh, presentations for parents. Um, and uh, I'm still getting, trying to get my uh, handle on who are the officers of the different PTOs. Um, but I am trying, I'm still looking for what we did back in May 27, 2009, which was a, a, um, it was a four hour event with multiple tracks of different presentations. Um, I, uh, I don't have a program from that. I, I believe I found some survey results. And obviously since it's 2009, it's, it's uh, maybe a little dated, but um, definitely something I think instead of reinventing the wheel, something that we can um, bring back again. Um, other than that, um, I got nothing else. Anthony, Anthony if I just, um, there's no no urgency necessarily on having a, a sooner diversity meeting, except only I might suggest a little early, just because myself and I don't think I speak for Flora, but I don't know if we're as um, in sync with the what's been happening in the previous meetings. Okay. So I feel like you know if we wait another wait till October, I'll really be able to jump in the next meeting. Does you know what I mean? That's fair. That's yeah. fair. So I'll look at the number. I'll look at some dates. Yeah, if you could. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um, and I, we don't have any dates for the curriculum committee yet, uh, so nothing to report there. I did want to um, just tell folks that the Dutchess County School Boards Association has a pretty interesting speaker um, that they're having on November 5th in Terry Johnson dinner, and this guy, John Marrow, is speaking who um, is talking about school reform, and it, it looked really interesting to me. I'm definitely going to go. Um, if anyone else wants to go, let me know. And also, this is jumping way ahead, but why not? Um, January 12th, they are having the legislative breakfast, which um, Kristen and I attended last year. And, and is Bill there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and uh, and uh, it was most of the legislators, legislators sent representatives, which so that wasn't that interesting. But it was really interesting to hear other school board members speak about um, what their districts are facing. So. Uh, mark your calendars. <laughs> and um, we don't have any unfinished business tonight. Um, we have to approve the tax warrant, and that's a roll call vote. So um, I think I need a motion to approve the tax warrant for the 2018-19 school tax, tax collection. Motion to approve the tax warrant for 2018-2019. My name right? Is your name not, or is your name on the roll call? We can make that happen. <laughs> I apologize that it's misspelled. I'm sorry. I mean, I'm kind of used to it, but it kind of sucks. That I'm third year. <laughs> oh, my grandmother gave me sorry, a bracelet. I'm sorry. 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 No, I'll call it. It's better, bit. I'm sorry, I missed the question. It's that you you are oh. voting in favor or against. Oh, you yes. just have to do it individually yeah. for the yes. Mr. Case Layout. Yes. Ms. Flynn. Yes. Mr. Rakowski. Oh, Ms. Stadler. Yes. Mr. Singh? Yes. Without the age. Mr. Wolf? Yes. Ms. Hewart? Yes. And Mr. Wright is excused. So that's 7 to 0 here. Great. And then, um, gonna, oh, sorry. I need to pass this in. It's okay. Okay. Should we right now? Consent agenda. The use of the consent agenda permits the Board of Education to make more effective use of its time by adopting a single motion to cover those relatively routine matters which are included. Any member of the board who wishes to discuss individually a particular piece of business on the consent agenda 
may so indicate and that item will be considered and voted on separately, thus preserving the right of all board members to be heard on any issue. So, um, does anyone have anything that they want to pull from the consent agenda? Okay, so I need a motion to approve items 12.01 to 12. Um, Motion to approve items 12.01 to 12.11. Council questions? So the, um, the, you said you mentioned there were changes. Those changes are part of that motion. Well, there's, I'm um, actually using, there, there, um, there's also a third, a 13 that has some of the changes. So we'll do that separately. Okay. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And then I need a motion to approve item 13.01 and .02 um, presented to the personnel lists. Do we read them for the record or no? Uh, I think, do we need to read them? You need the items on the yeah. list? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But there's two separate yeah. votes. Okay, so 13.01, I need a motion to approve it. So moved. Second. And any comments or questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 And then I need a motion to approve 13.02, addendum to the instructional personnel list. Motion. Second. Comments or questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, Do we need a second exact? Do we need a second exact? If there's no motion for second exact, I need a motion to adjourn. Okay, I need a motion. Are you motioning to adjourn? Yes. Need a second? Second. Comments or questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.